Dear distinguished speakers and uh, our honorable guests, my name is Justine Elferte. I am the head of the International Department at uh, the Riga Graduate School of Law, and uh, I will act as facilitator for our discussion today, the administrative judge and individual liberties during a pandemic. The discussion is organized by Riga Graduate School of Law in cooperation with the Embassy of France in Riga. And uh, the discussion will take place between uh, Mr. Bruno Lassard, the Vice President of the Conseil d'État or State Council of France, and Dr. Ina Taziemele, Judge at the Court of Justice of the European Union. Please note that the discussion is being recorded and it will be available for uh, viewing afterwards. And uh, for opening remarks, I would like to pass the floor to Ms. Eva Ratnaya, Director of Riga Graduate School of Law. Uh, good, morning. good morning, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. It is my honor to welcome you all to today's discussion organized by Riga Graduate School of Law and Embassy of France. Today's discussion is joined by two distinguished speakers, Mr. Bruno Lasser, Vice President of the French Council of State and Dr. Ina Taziemel, a judge at the Court of Justice of the European Union. Mr. Lasser is visiting Latvia by the invitation of President Egil Slevitz. During their meeting, they discussed and exchanged experiences on personal data protection and security. And among other things, they also discussed the role and mission of the Council of State. Also in Latvia, for quite some time, there is a public discussion on establishing Council of State with an aim to contribute to the quality of the legislative process and sustainability of the country. We believe that this exchange and experiences and ideas will be significant and beneficial for further promotion of this initiative also in Latvia. But today's discussion will be focused on the current situation brought by the still ongoing pandemic and its unprecedented impact to our rights and freedoms brought by the measures in order to protect the society. I would like to thank again the participants and especially Ambassador of France for their cooperation and wish you all productive and engaging discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ratner, for your remarks. The floor is now given to Her Excellency Aurélie Royeguna, the Ambassador of France to the Republic of Latvia. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, will be, I will be very brief because Madame Director has said uh, uh, most of what was uh, needed to get the, the general picture of uh, the context of this meeting. Uh, we are very happy to enjoy a very close cooperation uh, with many of the most uh, prominent uh, judicial institutions in Latvia, and we have had contacts between the State Council and, and uh, their different interlocutors in the Latvian judiciary system for uh, several years at the highest level. So it's, it's really a pleasure for us to come back regularly and have uh, the occasions to develop a very deep and fruitful cooperation. Uh, we have just had, as you were mentioning, Madam Director, a, a very interesting uh, moment to discuss with the president of Latvia. And uh, uh, we still have a very rich uh, program for the vice president of the State Council here today. But it's a very, a very nice opportunity for us to be able to have also a, a moment of of public discussion and a moment of, uh, of um, sharing uh, around the, the uh, uh, main challenges that are facing our judicial courts at the moment in time of pandemics. And we believe it's very useful to have these moments of debate, of exchange in a very challenging and very exceptional and weird moment that we are all going through also in terms of, uh, of legal challenges. So thank you very much to the Riga School of Law to have organized this, uh, this meeting, to have beautifully organized this meeting, and uh, we really look forward to a fruitful discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ambassador, for your remarks. It's uh, definitely an honor for Riga Graduate School of Law to be uh, organizing such a, an important discussion. Um, before we uh, move on, just a few uh, sort of clarifications and uh, housekeeping aspects that uh, all the registered participants who are uh, watching this discussion through um, their registration links, uh, they have the possibility to write questions in the chat. And uh, after the interventions on behalf of our distinguished speakers, we will have a, a questions and answers session where we might be able to address uh, quite a few of the questions asked. So feel free to uh, start using this uh, opportunity already uh, now as the discussion starts uh, taking place. And uh, now with the sort of housekeeping side uh, already done, it is time for our first uh, discussant. And uh, the floor goes to the Vice President of the Conseil d'État of France, His Excellency Bruno Lassard. The floor is yours. 
this is um, Elfete for your nice um, introduction and uh, two words to tell you how I'm pleased to uh, participate in this web conference organized by the Riga Graduate School of Law, whose director, Mrs. Yeva Ratsenaya, uh, would like to thank very warmly. It changes between judges, academics, administrators, and lawyers from uh, different countries are always a source of uh, mutual enrichment, allowing us to take a step back uh, from our practices and to learn and sometimes to be inspired by what is done um, elsewhere. In this respect, I'm sincerely pleased to have been invited to dialogue with you, even if I would obviously have preferred that we meet in person, but the pandemic uh, decided otherwise. And I would like to say a few words to Judge uh, Ineta Zimele. I'm very, very pleased to um, exchange with you, um, well, to have this new opportunity to exchange with you, with you this morning and my best wishes. And I do look forward uh, to new opportunities to meeting again in, in, in person. And thank you again for the support and the constant support and the enthusiasm you put in the idea of uh, creating a new body in Latvia, inspired, I would say, from the French uh, model. Why Conseil d'État? I have no time to develop. What is the institution? And I would be very happy to answer questions about the precise role of the Council of State in French. It's a very old institution. In fact, dating back from the Middle Ages, it was formerly the King's Council, um, helping the, gov the, the King, in fact, to decide on, well, I would say, public business. Um, and that's why the head of the Conseil d'État is the vice president. Every, nobody answer, understands why, but the reason is uh, because it was the King's Council, nobody dares, I would say, to sit in the royal chair. So we imagine it's a fiction, there is still somebody around the table who doesn't exist anymore. And uh, the, 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 the status of the Conseil d'État provide that the vice president chair the, 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 the Conseil d'État. And we, we open the doors every year to visitors to visit the Palais Royal where uh, we have our headquarters. Well, when you say that, the, the, the office of the vice president, but who is the, who is the president? Is it Monsieur Macron? Is it the prime minister? No, he is the vice president. No, he can't be the president because he's vice president. But that's, you know, a sort of um, clinch to our, um, to our um, history. The fact that we, uh, we can't meet, uh, that we can't move around uh, freely, that we can't live, in fact, the way we used to, is enough to uh, show how our freedom are limited. Freedoms are limited by the need to stop the, the spread of COVID-19 and to protect our health. In this respect, the current crisis represents a test uh, to our democracies. It questions our ability to collectively overcome a formidable ordeal without denying what we hold most dear, our values, our freedoms, uh, our rule of law. And uh, like many other countries, the French public authorities have reacted to the threat with an unprecedented um, mobilization, material and human uh, mobilization on the one hand and legal mobilization on the other. Since a state of health emergency was declared in March 2020, giving the government exceptional powers uh, to enable it to act quickly uh, and strongly. And the use of such um, an exception regime approved on several occasions by parliament was certainly useful and justified as normal procedures are not always sufficient to deal with the most serious disasters in an extreme emergency. However, in a democracy, in a, a country with a rule of law, an exceptional regime is only compatible with the rule of law on condition that it remains temporary and that effective controls are provided. In this respect, the administrative judge is a key player. It is he who has to check 
that the government is acting in accordance with the rule of law. It is he who, request after request, has to balance the imperative of protecting citizens' health against the infringement of individual freedoms that it imposes. And its control is only effective if it is accessible and as emergency procedures um, in, enable it to guarantee the rule of law in real time. So in France, it is the administrative courts and the Conseil d'État is at the head, I would say, of the pyramid, which has been entrusted with this task. One year after the start of the crisis, a number of lessons can be drawn from the way in which it has carry out, carried out this task. And it is these lessons I would like to share with you uh, this morning. First, I will begin by a few points on the activity of the emergency proceedings judge of the Council of State since the beginning of the health crisis. This activity has been marked by the exceptional number of applications referred to him and by the very wide range of questions uh, put to him. First, like, I would like to give uh, some figures, which are in fact impressive. Between March 17, 2020 and March 17, 2021, the Council of State heard exactly 647 uh, emergency applications in connection with COVID-19. I think it's a record in, in, in Europe. And this figure is considerable, is huge. It is equivalent approximately to 10% of what the Council of State receives and judges each year in all its litigation activities. To deal with this unprecedented uh, influx of uh, applications, the Council of State immediately go down to work at the very beginning of the crisis when most other public institutions had ceased uh, to function, a team of 15 uh, very experienced uh, judges was assembled around the president and deputy presidents of the Council of State's litigation uh, division. They dealt with all the applications registered during the first lockdown. Also, emergency proceedings are in principle single judge proceedings. These judges actually worked as a team, constantly discussing and coordinating to ensure consistency uh, in their decisions. Then, as of May 2020, this team was disbanded and the Council of State returned to normal operations so that the processing of non-urgent cases could resume. But beyond the figures, we were struck by the diversity of the applications submitted to uh, the emergency proceedings uh, judge. Diversity of um, applicants on the one hand, uh, applications have come from individuals, from companies, from associations, from trade unions, and even from political parties. Secondly, the questions asked were very different, very varied, I would say. Some applications sought to increase the severity uh, of the lockdown, others to reduce it. Some raised questions of pure legality, others extremely concrete problems relating in particular to the organization and the functioning of public bodies and services. Most of the major fundamental freedoms were also invoked from right to life, to a freedom to come and go, including the right to health, freedom of worship, freedom of assembly, freedom of enterprise, and the right, for example, to demonstrate. And in fact, if I can resume, three main categories of claims can be identified in this mass. The first is the most traditional. It includes applications for the suspension of rules, either national or local. This may, be, this may have been measures taken to adapt a particular legal mechanism to the health context, such as an unemployment insurance or criminal procedure. 
but it is of course the challenges to administrative policy measures that have received the most attention, particularly in the media. I'm thinking, for example, of the requests to suspend the closure of places of entertainment, bookshops and restaurants, or the disputes that have arisen around the framework of freedom of worship or of demonstration. Other examples include applications challenging the legality of the obligation to wear a mask in public places or the requirement for French citizens abroad to show a compelling reason to return to France. A second category includes requests to adapt the organization of the public service in order to better protect its staff or users. Here, administrative shortcomings were alleged and the applicants asked the judge to remedy them by defining new organization procedure measures. The provision of masks, gels, and other protective equipment against the virus was, for example, requested for health um, workers or in prisons. Um, there were also requests to organize better screening and access into care for residents of institutions housing the elderly. A third category includes petitions challenging the government's overall uh, health policy. For example, petitioners asked the judge to order the government to authorize the prescription of hydrochloroquine, for example, um, to modify the list of companies considered as essential to the nation or to requisition stocks or companies to ensure an adequate supply of health materials. I will now turn to the second part of my presentation to say that the Council of States response, responses to these applications can only be understood in the light of the special role of the emergency uh, judge. First, maybe some words uh, to explain the two main emergency procedures available to the French administrative judge. The first procedure is what we call the emergency suspension procedure, référé suspension in French, which allows the judge to suspend an administrative decision or regulation as a matter of urgency when there is, I quote, a serious doubt about its legality. And in this procedure, the judge's powers are limited. There must be first a decision to suspend. The law does not not expressly provide for a time limit within, it must, it, within which it must rule. And on the other hand, the test uh, the judge undertakes is relatively easy to pass. You have to show that there is a serious doubt about the legality of the decision you challenge. This procedure is especially effective for submitting questions of pure legality to the judge. But there is, and it has been incredibly successful, a second procedure available in France, which is called the référé liberté, référé liberté uh, in French. And um, um, in, in this procedure, the balance is very different from the référé uh, suspension. Here, the judge may, in fact, order all measures, any measure necessary to put an end to what I, what I quote, a serious and manifestly illegal um, infringement of a fundamental freedom by a public authority. His powers are thus very extensive. Uh, he can seize any behavior of the administration, action or inaction, for example. You don't need to challenge a decision. You can challenge a behavior. And the judge is finally required to act within 48 hours. So it's a very special, I would say, emergency procedure. On the other hand, the law is particularly demanding as to the infringement that must be um, established. You need to evidence uh, a, a, an infringement, which is, of course, serious and manifestly illegal 
to a fundamental um, freedom. And it is uh, in this light of the powers available to seize two judges, two procedures, that the handling of the applications referred to them must be assessed. Firstly, whether it is a judge of référé suspension or of référé liberté, the Council of State has frequently had to review the proportionality of the decisions um, of failures to act challenged by the applicants. This proportionality test, and uh, Ineta Zimile knows very well because it's uh, something we share in Europe and especially in the European Court of Justice, explains why at the beginning of the crisis, when the health risk was maximum, the judge considered that the restrictions on freedoms were necessary and proportionate to the objective of protecting the health of the population. Conversely, when the risk began to diminish, to decrease, some of these restrictions lost their justification. And this is the meaning um, of the series of decisions handed down at the end of last spring, in which the Conseil d'État suspended the bans on gatherings in places, for example, of worship or demonstrations on the public highway. Most recently, given the great uncertainty about the short-term health um, outlook, this review is the reason for the Council of State's refusal to suspend the closure of several public places. In any event, 51 out of 647 applications were received resulted in a suspension, paralyzing, in fact, the application of the contested rule and or an injunction to the government um, to change its policy, to change uh, its regulation in order to achieve a better and more proportionate balance between efficiency of the fight against the pandemics and protection of uh, freedoms and individual rights. Secondly, many decisions handed down by the Council of State can be explained by the particular office of the judge of référé liberté. The judge is all about finding measures to effectively put an immediate aid to infringements of fundamental freedoms. This wise this judge takes into account the means available to the administration and the measures it has already taken. This is the expression of a principle of reality, I would say, that the judge cannot afford to ignore. For what use would it be to order the distribution, for example, of thousands of masks, as some uh, applicants requested, when the administration at the beginning was uh, absolutely materially unable uh, to do so. It also shows, I would say, the humility uh, of a judge who ruling in 48 hours often does not have the means to define himself the measures that the administration should take on several weeks or even months. I would add that this consideration of the means available to the administration on the date on which the judge um, uh, rules appeared all the more relevant during the crisis, as many of the disputes concerned the way in which the government managed, in fact, a certain scarcity, scarcity of medical equipment, saturation of uh, resuscitation beds, availab availability uh, of staff. This being said, the judge of the référé liberté never resigned himself to noting the administration's lack of resource. On the contrary, it has constantly sought concrete solutions to better safeguard the fundamental freedoms invoked by the applicants. Hearings, oral hearings, have proved extremely useful in this respect. It is very often through an oral discussion with the parties that solutions have been found. And the more the disputes concerned uh, the specific organization and operation of particular public service, the more useful the discussion appeared to be to the judge in grasping, I would say, all the ins and outs of the problems before um, him. Finally, I come to my third point, 
to say uh, what the COVID-19 emergency litigation has uh, highlighted, the essential role of the administrative judge in the service uh, of the rule of law, but also the importance of not stepping outside the scope of its powers. Throughout the, the crisis, the Council of State was present, able to investigate, able to hear, I would say, um, uh, contest by the parties, able to, um, to handle very quickly uh, submissions uh, to, 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 to him, to monitor the administration's action in detail. Thanks to its summary emergency proceedings, it was the privilege, in fact, interlocutor of all citizens who wished to question the management of the pandemic. He also constantly put the administration under pressure, I would say, especially during hearings, and sometimes six hour hearings, um, during which he always sought ways to do better, to reduce the infringement of fundamental freedoms while guaranteeing the effectiveness of the fight against the virus. Finally, there was no, in fact, exceptional justice, which is a sign of a form of continuity of the rule of law, despite the circumstances, the procedures and methods of control of the administrative judge did not vary. The main difficulty faced by the emergency judge was to remain within its own role. For in a state governed by the rule of law, there is a place for, I would say, the politician, there is a place for the expert, the scientific expert, and there is a place for the judge. Each must remain in his or her place. And staying in one's place has meant in particular not encroaching on the political and scientific domains. Two examples, for example. Firstly, how could the judge have ordered the government to authorize the prescription, for example, in, uh, in ordinary um, medicine of hydroxychloroquine in March 2020, when the only studies available at that day suffered from methodological shortcomings and did not allow any conclusions to be drawn about the effectiveness of this um, product. Secondly, when at the very beginning of the crisis, a doctor's union asked the judge to order an even stricter lockdown of the entire French population, I would say a Chinese lockdown, I remain convinced that it was not up to a judge and even less to an emergency judge to take a decision so fraught with consequences that it can only reasonably be a matter of health strategy for the political authorities. I would add that remaining on this ridge has been and continues to be a delicate task for a judge, especially as the law doesn't provide precisely the way in which an epidemic is to be countered and scarce resource must be allocated. And because the notions of the right to life and the right to health invoked by the applicants, which are in our jurisprudence, fundamental freedoms are the liberty to come and go, the liberty to travel, the liberty to operate a company, the liberty to demonstrate. Uh, they are fundamental freedoms. And it's very difficult in the judicial balance to weigh, I would say, uh, liberties between them. It's not, I would say, um, a fight uh, public order against public liberties. We have to conciliate public liberties between them, in fact, and to, to achieve a balance between public liberties, which are at the same level in our constitution, in our uh, rule of law. So thank you very much for um, uh, taking uh, your time to, to hear me. What I wanted to say about the way in which the Council of State has dealt with the health crisis over the past year, there is, of course, still a lot to be said, and we are committed as um, of September 2020 to a process of evaluation that will enable us to learn all the lessons 
about our management of the crisis so uh, that we can do even bit better in the future. And it's a spirit I'm now very curious to know your reactions and eager to try to um, answer the, the questions that you are welcomed to, to ask me. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Vice, uh, Vice President, uh, for your uh, interaction. And uh, I will uh, second what you just said, that indeed uh, you have uh, the excellent opportunity to ask your questions uh, in the chat for uh, any clarifications that you might need, or maybe you have some following um, rem remarks uh, with regards to what has been said. And uh, for the second uh, perspective on our today's discussion, I will pass the floor to um, Dr. In Yes, um, uh, good morning. Um, I uh, hope uh, we are still uh, functioning because uh, <laughs> I think our moderator, <laughs> at least here in Luxembourg, <laughs> we lost our moderator. Um, well, it is a great pleasure for me to uh, meet uh, in this uh, discussion with you, uh, Mr. Vice President uh, of the French uh, State Council. I'm very happy to have this opportunity to exchange uh, our experiences and uh, I will offer you um, a comment on how we managed uh, the situation uh, in Latvia. Um, Your Excellency, Madam Ambassador and uh, my dear colleagues uh, of the uh, uh, Riga Graduate School of Law, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, you heard uh, uh, Mr. Lassier uh, giving us a, a very important uh, insight uh, into how uh, the French citizens uh, have been uh, protecting their freedoms uh, during uh, the pandemics. And uh, what I heard actually, uh, an incredible role of the uh, administrative jurisdiction uh, with the uh, Conseil d'État, um, on top of it, uh, I must say um, the Latvian uh, citizens uh, have been uh, more quiet in uh, protecting uh, their rights, but there have been there have been uh, important uh, complaints, um, and uh, some of them have uh, also reached uh, the constitutional court uh, and also the administrative court. Now. Um, the way um, uh, I will evidently uh, present to you um, mostly the experience uh, of the Constitutional Court, uh, the reason being that uh, until recently uh, I was presiding uh, the Constitutional Court and when the pandemics uh, hit Latvia um, as the president of the Constitutional Court together with my colleagues, uh, the judges, we actually had to answer the questions that Bruno Lassier had already put forward to us. What's the role of the Constitutional Court in the times of public emergency? And so I will reflect uh, on that. Uh, just so that we all know, the Constitutional Court uh, has a special place uh, in the uh, judicial power uh, of the Republic of Latvia. And the Constitutional Court uh, is also a, one of the uh, effective remedies for the protection of fundamental rights. And it is therefore that uh, uh, the role that was played and continues to be played by the Constitutional Court um, is very important. Now, I would like to touch upon, however, three, uh, uh, three uh, uh, aspects of uh, uh, Latvia uh, managing uh, the challenges uh, of this uh, unexpected, I must say, uh, pandemic. Now, uh, th the first aspect uh, that I would like to draw your attention to is in fact the functioning of a democratic state in the circumstances where democratic debate, the way we know it, is limited or not even possible. And indeed, um, it is uh, more than ever, and we came to the same conclusion, that in the times when we cannot normally debate 
the type of debate that goes into decision making in a rule of law state. Uh, also in Latvia, we had to take uh, grips of how to ensure that uh, the democratic values and the rule of law continues to function. I will uh, uh, explain how we did that. Uh, secondly, I will also uh, reflect a little bit on the test of necessity and proportionality. How did you guess? <laughs> um, because uh, uh, that is a key issue on uh, uh, how we manage uh, the pandemics uh, and the way uh, just th this whole situation, in fact, you know, goes over the fundamental rights uh, that uh, we are so used to uh, benefiting from. And uh, uh, the, uh, the, the final uh, comment I will have on actually on the role of the judiciary uh, in the pandemics, and maybe on that one, we can also have um, uh, exchange of uh, views. Um, now, as I already mentioned, as to the first point, um, when the emergency situation was declared in Latvia on 13 March, uh, what happened was the working places emptied, the public institutions uh, closed down, and there was no possibility to receive, as we are used to, uh, the clients or in the courts, uh, sort of uh, people uh, coming with their complaints. And so um, in Latvia, um, the... Uh, um, social distancing and also sort of the gathering within sort of same room uh, for uh, uh, bodies taking uh, collegial decisions, taking democratic decisions has been particularly difficult. Uh, I can just describe you over the recent days, uh, we had um, a judge of the constitutional court sworn in on Zoom. Um, we also had, uh, we've had uh, the constitutional court and administrative courts have had their public hearings on Zoom. And they have been, notably the constitutional court uh, public hearings in the cases have as a result been made available on YouTube. And what happens? The upside of the pandemic, the whole country can now follow because normally the public hearing room would not fit a uh, thousand of peoples uh, that have been following the constitutional court. So that has been the reality due to the restrictions advised by the medical experts, due to the restrictions that have been uh, uh, adopted uh, in Latvia. These are the methods of how uh, Latvia has managed to continue on with decision-making. As you probably have heard, you had the visit uh, with the Speaker of the Parliament. There is an e-Parliament in Latvia now, the first one probably in the world. Now, uh, none of these uh, situations or measures, strict or senso, have been foreseen by the Constitution. And so in Latvia, since 13 March, uh, there has been a very important uh, debate, questions, is this in accordance with the constitution? Is this in accordance with the rule of law and a democratic decision making? Now, um, what uh, we did in the constitutional courts, um, we had internal uh, um, uh, consultation among the judges and the staff after 13 March, and we decided, uh, first thing, the reason we went on uh, to use these technological tools was the following, because we decided, uh, especially in times of public emergency, justice must be seen to be done. And so we used everything that was available uh, in Latvia uh, to make sure that we continue adjudicating cases within the deadlines provided for in the law on the electronic, uh, on digital platforms that were available. But the principle was justice must be seen to be done. It was important to ensure a certain normalcy in the society, in abnormal circumstances. 
Now, on 23 March, uh, for the first time in the history uh, of Latvia, the President of the Republic called uh, a consultation meeting of the three branches of power. Uh, the Parliament, uh, the Speaker of the Parliament, the Prime Minister, uh, the President of the Constitutional Court, and the Chief Justice, uh, the, the, the Chairman of the, of the Supreme Court. And during these, uh, uh, this was actually what, what, what you mentioned, uh, Monsieur uh, Lasserre, uh, this incredible mobilization of uh, pouvoir public, uh, public power. This was the Latvian moment uh, of mobilization of the constitutional uh, powers. And in that consultation, uh, we came to adopting a joint statement where, in fact, we reiterated that the very essence of the constitution is to make sure that the state powers continue to function in the interests of everyone and the society as such. And if it takes uh, electronic or digital or technological tools to ensure the continuous functioning, to, conti uh, to ensure the decision-making that was necessary, then that's what it takes. That exactly stems from the constitution. It's its very raison d'être, that the state is there, especially in times of pandemic, for the people. So that was the first principle on which all of the branches of power agreed. The second principle was that the judiciary continues uh, and is especially important to see that uh, 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 the individual rights are not disproportionately and unnecessarily um, uh, uh, restricted in times of pandemic. And also that the parliament controls the government. We are a parliamentary republic. So for us, there are additional difficulties because it is not so easy in the Latvian constitutional idea to give powers to the government, even in time of emergency. So uh, the, the principle was reiterated, the parliament has an ultimate control over the measures that are adopted by the government and the judiciary in the end. And the principle, the test to be applied is the test of strict necess necessity when uh, individual rights are uh, uh, violated. So that was the moment of mobilization for Latvia. I consider that that was a very important because in a way it gave the framework, it put the house in order and it was uh, subsequently easier with these guidelines to manage um, uh, the situation. Now, it is very true, you already mentioned the incredible variety of individual rights and freedoms that in fact are restricted uh, in, uh, during uh, this type uh, of pandemic. It is the whole economic activity uh, that is restricted. It is the freedom of assembly. It's the family reunions, for example, in Latvia, but also in France. Um, uh, it is uh, the travel restrictions. So um, there, as I mentioned, on uh, at least a number of them, there have been complaints lodged with the Latvian courts, not as abundant as in France, <laughs> as I already noted, but uh, the first constitutional court judgment uh, on pandemic uh, was rendered uh, on uh, 11 December 2020. And that is, um, 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 that's a case law. That's, that's uh, um, uh, in fact, a guiding sort of, in terms of law, uh, this is the judgment uh, uh, which should guide uh, everyone how the court, uh, uh, the, the method that the constitutional court uh, used now, of course, is the guiding light uh, for everybody. But, um, you know, our case was, and not because it's difficult to Latvia, I believe, but that was the case uh, on the emergency law, on the articles in emergency law, which prohibited gambling. Gambling in uh, public places, in casinos and similar places, and gambling on internet. Um, now, 
as I say, I don't think it characterizes the, the, the freedom that uh, Latvian citizens are particularly uh, interested to protect in the court. I think there are other uh, more important um, issues. Now, what the Constitutional Court uh, did, I think, are two extremely important issues. First, the judgment, of course, is long uh, in, and it's very complex and, and, and detailed. But um, first of all, uh, the court had the possibility to assess this particular legislative process that the government and the parliament uh, adopted during pandemic. It's, a, it's, an, it's not a typical legislative process that you would have in times of peace with enough time for debate, with enough time for scientific evidence, it's not a typical process. So the Constitutional Court, for the first time, had the chance to see what uh, impact may pandemics have on legislative process, sort of what, what is the margin of manoeuvre uh, within. Uh, and I think that the... Uh, 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 essential point that comes from the judgment is, yes, the government, the executive is the key to managing pandemics and adapting decisions. But in parliamentary country, the parliament always keeps the right to oversee, control and change if the parliament sees that the executive has not, in the spur of a moment, has not acted properly. Um, uh, in light of the constitution. As far as the proportionality test of the interference with the right to property, uh, in this case, it was it turned around the right to property. The constitutional court does not develop a particular um, test of the assessment uh, of necessity and proportionality um, of this uh, interference. Uh, the constitutional court basically goes business as usual in fact, in assessing the proportionality test, possibly because the Constitutional Court uh, established that the government did not submit uh, to the Council of Europe uh, uh, a declaration uh, uh, with regard to right to property, protocol number one, to the Convention on, uh, uh, on, on Human Rights. The government made exceptions with regard to some rights, but it did not include right to property. So with regard to right to property, the, uh, the state of uh, the emergency was not meant to uh, do much harm. However, uh, this is a case where we see that pandemic uh, was the one that influenced the legislator in uh, adopting the prohibition to use, uh, to resort to gambling in these uh, gambling uh, halls. Uh, and so uh, there probably is, is something still to reflect on. Now, uh, Latvia, th this was a very interesting point you raised on emergency procedures within uh, French administrative procedure. The Constitutional Court doesn't have any special power with regard to emergency procedure. And I think that could be one important reflection to be made now as a lesson to be learned. Because uh, when listening to you, I thought, um, yeah, uh, pandemics has opened many questions for the Latvian administrative and constitutional uh, procedure law. And I think uh, in terms of how we, hopefully we don't have, we manage this pandemic and then we, Live, live in peace afterwards. But, uh, but still, uh, this is an opportunity to look whether the green, uh, uh, the green uh, uh, couloir, the green corridors, you know, um, are sufficiently available to administrative and constitutional judges. And I must say, I don't think that is the case um, in Latvia. Now, um, what it showed also the pandemics, the constitutional court pulled itself together, uh, uh, I, th I think, uh, uh, incredibly, incredibly well, but it showed that other courts across Latvia had difficulties. And that's another because of the availability of technologies or for other reasons. And I think this is yet another possibility to now take stock because that is helpful to 
the functioning uh, of the entire judiciary in Latvia. I would I would really invite the relevant authorities now to assess what were the difficulties for the courts to keep adjudicating uh, during uh, uh, the uh, pandemics. Now. I've already mentioned uh, uh, along uh, how the Constitutional Court continued adjudicating by uh, cases as they were planned because of no green corridor. So as the cases were planned in accordance with the law, uh, the court had to had to continue working and it has worked really a lot. Uh, adjudicating on important reforms being passed because the state the state did not stop the state as much as possible continued functioning as usual and implementing important reforms such as administrative reform. Um, now, what I see is just to share, you know, um, we can talk also how the Court of Justice, for example, uh, confronted the pandemics and, and very similarly uh, with the same sort of uh, main purpose. Uh, justice must be seen to be done and in a much more complex situation than a single court with a single language here in the Court of Justice, the court has to manage many languages often in the case at the same time. It's, it's absolutely fascinating what experience we are living at this moment and the opportunity it gives to us, you know, to see what assistance is still needed to the judiciary and also what procedures could be um, uh, improved. Now, the final point I would like to make is the following. Um, to me, to me, um, the challenges uh, presented and adjustments of procedures and proceedings that we had to all uh, resort to, they actually raise uh, a very interesting question of, do we consider that the way we functioned, and it's uh, in many countries, certainly in Latvia, a lot in the Court of Justice, we functioned with distance, lots of proceedings uh, were moved to written procedure, um, luckily, Latvian Constitutional Court actually did become even more transparent thanks to the, uh, to, the, to the technological tools. But the question really we need to ask, do we see that the way we manage so far the pandemics, has that been compatible with the principles of fairness, legitimacy, of a fair a trial of judicial control. Uh, this is very helpful. Why? Because we have another ongoing debate uh, on digital world. Uh, this French Council of State is very much in the middle of developing jurisprudence on data protection, on, on digital tools, etc. The question really is the pandemics gives us the opportunity to get a sense maybe of how far we enlarge our understanding of legitimacy and fairness of judicial proceedings. You know, how far we are fine with digital tools helping the judge to judge the case. This is this whole huge discussion we have started in 21st century and the pandemics actually made us play it out in reality. And so this is a very interesting question. And I stop with that. And I thank you for your uh, attention. Thank you so much, uh, Judge Ineta Um Before I proceed and uh, open the floor for uh, just a few uh, questions, perhaps, uh, Monsieur Bruno Lassar, would you would like to respond to uh, Ineta Ziemele's uh, remarks uh, briefly? Um, thank you very much. And uh, I've been really... Um, Really interested by your remarks, Judge um, Neta Zimele, um, and um, especially uh, the, the 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 final point you you, you made. Um, I think first it's quite important for our democracies to show that they are ready to face hard times and uh, that the rule of law 
is stronger uh, than the times we live in. And I think that's very important to show that democracy and rule of law, well, need to have an effective government to define an efficient strategy, need a, an effective parliament, which must be a, a counter power in terms of uh, evaluation and control, and an effective judge who is able to handle rapidly and efficiently disputes which arise. And personally, I think it's much better than disputes are solved by a judge, by a peaceful and fair, I would say, procedure, rather than uh, these frustrations, these uh, claims, these unsatisfaction show, is showed in the street by demonstrators or, or, or rights. And I think it's a sign of the health, I would say, of the country to be able to show that harm times don't change uh, this, this balance and the need to have these three uh, powers active, accessible, and, um, and transparent. Second, I do agree with um, you, um, Ineta, if I allow, um, on the fact that the pandemic has been a fantastic field of experience. It's a learning process. And I think that's very important. And in, in the French Council of State, I've been struck by the mobilization, the innovation of everybody, judges, staff, everybody was ready to help, to help the others, to work differently. And I think the worst in, in that period would be once the crisis is over, come back to routine, to the way we were working before. I think just on the contrary, we must show that we have learned from that time, that everybody has brought innovation, help, contribution, and that we must, in fact, take into account that innovations in order to do better, I would say, um, our job. And I'm very keen in French in, you know, gathering uh, evaluation groups with every kind of people, uh, trying to evaluate what we did, the quality of the answer we made, is it good, is it right, is it wrong, could we do better? And then to integrate that in our processes. Um, and I think that's very, 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 um, very important. Uh, so this crisis will not be a good memory, but certainly a, a positive step to um, uh, modernize, to make our, um, uh, our processes more transparent. The last point is about visibility. Uh, the Conseil d'État uh, is, of course, a very prestigious and old institution, but not very well known by the ordinary citizen. And suddenly, you saw at the television uh, every 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 uh, every night, every evening. Well, the Conseil d'État has decided that or that, and uh, people were realizing that this very very I would say, uh, well, vague or uh, institution was deciding on daily matters uh, with their daily life. Uh, uh, do I have the right to demonstrate? Do I have the right to go to church? Do I have the right to travel? Who are they? Who are they? Uh, why do they, how can they decide on my daily life? So my last point is about the need in that field of time to um, devote much resource, time and care about explaining who we are, how we do, and uh, what is uh, the meaning of, of our institution. Um, and um, I think uh, um, in, in that period, we had to do much more in terms of media uh, explanation, uh, pedagogy, I would say, uh, daily explanation about why we, we and what, what is the standard on which we decide right or wrong. And uh, uh, that's my last uh, point. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Monsieur Lassard. And uh, your uh, last comments have co kind of already steered us in the in the direction of one of the questions that has come in from uh, a student of uh, Riga Graduate School of Law. And uh, maybe I can uh, again pass the pass the floor to uh, Judge Ineta Ziemela with this one. And uh, the question sort of concerns this aspect uh, where the general public has expressed more interest in the constitutional uh, aspects of your country and whether this is sort of a, a trend that we see that might stay 
after the pandemic and uh, what are the considerations that we should uh, take uh, take into account to ensure that this public activity uh, remains uh, yes, um, I mean it's a it's a it's a wonderful discussion, I must say, and I wish we had more time to to continue and go into detail. And um, you know, I've always uh, uh, taken a position, and that probably stems also from my experience at the Strasbourg Court. Um, I came back to Latvia saying that the judiciary has to be more understandable to the people. And given that we have uh, now technologies, which is absolutely wonderful, uh, we can certainly use them for this pedagogy that you were talking about, uh, Monsieur Lesser. And so the Constitutional Court, in fact, started that long before the pandemic. Uh, there, there is a whole strategy of communication in place uh, of the Constitutional Court, but also of the courts of general jurisdiction in Latvia. And so in a way that was very lucky, but it is very true, it is very true that um, uh, the pandemic uh, in Latvia, it's a combination of things. Uh, the pandemic uh, has alerted uh, citizens more to their rights, in fact. That's that's at least Latvian uh, story. For historical reasons, that's quite understandable. I mean, we are still learning our freedoms um, as Latvians, I must say. Um, so the pandemics, for the first time, sort of um, um, uh, en masse uh, made it realize, well, now I feel different. I feel restricted. I can't do what I'm, I took for granted. I can no longer do. And so it's a learning process of human rights, actually, on daily basis. And I think it's a very important learning experience. And yes, it is a very uh, important learning experience for all of the constitutional bodies, for all of the uh, uh, branches of power, which actually tells we are not very good yet at that, I must say. But the demand is there to explain the functioning of the constitutional powers better and to actually show that they are there not for themselves. They are not, uh, you know, the beginning or the end of it. They are there exactly for these freedoms of everybody. And um, what the pandemic does uh, is it simply um, uh, makes it, it makes us in a in a more concentrated uh, space, I should say, uh, in a more mobilized context where all of this uh, plays out uh, at once. You know, there is just no time to, to for, de uh, for decades to, to build something or think about something. You have to do it tomorrow or even yesterday. Okay. And so all of the considerations play in within 24 hours. And it is this situation that, in fact, has um, uh, a capacity, if you think about it, to bring out what is strong about, you know, human society and democracy and, and the state. And, uh, uh, and I would say the combination of things, it's the people, it's the judges, uh, it's the constitutional court, it's the president, the parliament, the whole lot of it has made, uh, in fact, Latvian society to realize, you know, that they make the state, they are part of the state, and they are, you know, we are all there together to try to move on uh, uh, with this pandemic to fight against it, of course. What is interesting now, there is a question about the vaccine. We have to discuss it, but you know what, what it makes me think? Um, that makes me think of what, uh, in fact, President Macron, uh, when he took office, uh, what he said, uh, the challenge for, for human race, um, for all of the states of the planet, is uh, whether we will be able to move to the principle, to the level of solidarity among all of us. It's the, it's the, the, the key word is solidarity. And in fact, this whole business of talking of uh, of talking, do I do I uh, want a vaccine or not? To me, at the lower level, of course, it really uh, raises the question: Do we uh, do we believe in a value of solidarity and responsibility? Not just the rights, not just that I have, I can have it, but am I able to also be responsible with regard to the others? 
And we have in our liberal world forgotten about that for certain reasons, for good reasons, I believe. And now is the moment to ask the, the other side of the coin, my responsibility towards everybody else. Um, so it's, uh, I, I still think it's, it's absolutely um, um, uh, incredible moment um, to ask ourselves who we are uh, and, and what our institutions can do. Regrettably, we are uh, already beginning to uh, sort of run on uh, borrowed time, but uh, I would still want to continue for uh, just a few seconds to allow for uh, each of our distinguished speakers to uh, uh, provide us with some concluding remarks. So perhaps we can start with uh, Monsieur Lasser. I'm very sorry because I would have been delighted to answer more precisely questions from um, from the, uh, those who attend the, the web conference. One word about the vaccine. I saw there has been a, a question about vaccine. No, in France, they, there's no plan to make vaccination um, compulsory. We had some disputes about uh, the beginning shortage of uh, vaccines and maybe the, prior to, the priority order in which uh, vaccines were allocated to, to population. And I expect there would be um, in the future maybe some legal complaints about what is contemplated in Europe, the possibility to create what you call a health pass. Um, I'm sure there will be uh, legal complaints about, uh, about that. There has been an excellent question about uncertainty. Uh, maybe the most difficult challenge for those who decide is that they have to decide while they don't know everything about the virus can be disseminated and so on. And maybe the most difficult challenge is about that, how to decide in a time where we don't know and where there's still a lot of uncertainty. So how does the judiciary cope with this uncertainty? I would say two ways. First, um, in France, and I'm sure it exists in Latvia, um, a scientific committee has been put in place uh, to advise the government and uh, every every uh, week or uh, uh, twice a month to uh, make an evaluation of the health situation. And of course, the emergency judge at the Conseil d'État relied very much on the uh, opinions of this uh, scientific committee to evaluate in an impartial way the state of the, of the, of the crisis. And sometimes we questioned experts in our uh, overall um, proceedings, in our oral um, hearings. Then the question, very, the very important question is, do in the judicial review of uh, public decisions, do we take into account the existence of uncertainty? I think that's a very good question. Uh, do we allow government a larger uh, margin of appreciation because they have to take into account uncertainty. My answer will be yes, especially in emergency procedure called référé liberté. Because as I mentioned it, the standard for the judge to act is the violation, manifestly illegal violation of a fundamental freedom. And in this standard, manifestly illegal, in fact, implicitly, we take into account uncertainty. Uh, it must be obvious. Uh, it must be evident. Uh, okay, and uh, so it takes into account the uh, existence of um, uncertainty. No, just a, a few words to to say how I've been delighted to take part in this uh, web conference. Um, you know, meeting again with uh, friends and colleagues, being stimulated by wonderful uh, introductions and. Uh, Questions, and I look forward to continuing this dialogue. I would be uh, delighted um, to, to, to have a, a new web conference from the Palais Royal in Paris. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm, I regret very much not having much time to, uh, to spend with you. Uh, I, 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 well, all my best wishes to um, everybody, uh, all my best wishes for the future. I do look forward to having new opportunities to meet, to discuss, to exchange. And as uh, Judge Ineta Zimele uh, said it very convincingly, to share with you what is a formidable uh, field of uh, experience. Um, we, we, in a certain way, we are very lucky to live in present times. Thank you very much. Uh, Judge Zimele, the floor is yours. 
Yes, I would. Um, I would just like to thank uh, really the uh, Madam Ambassador and uh, uh, Mr. Vice President uh, and the Riga Graduate School of Law. I have in a very short time already learned a lot and I can just advise the Latvian judges to look up uh, the jurisprudence of the Conseil d'État um, with regard to the restrictions of freedoms during the time pandemic. I heard a lot of sort of um, uh, methodological elements that really uh, could be used. And uh, so thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's been lovely that you had the visit um, to Riga. Um, and I really, truly cherish uh, the cooperation and the friendship that I've had a chance to uh, participate uh, over the last years. And I do look forward to our exchanges and to continuation of our friendship. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to uh, our distinguished speakers. Uh, I believe that uh, the interest and uh, just the topicality of this is uh, so important that uh, uh, as Riga Graduate School of Law, we might uh, indeed be very interested in continuing this and uh, perhaps following up on the discussion that we have started today in uh, the not so distant future. And uh, for concluding remarks on uh, behalf of Riga Graduate School of Law, uh, I would like to pass the floor to Ms. Eva Ratsanaya. Thank you, Justina. Uh, yes, on behalf of Riga Graduate School of Law, I would really extend my gratitude and thanks to all the participants and especially to you, Ambassador, for idea. Uh, and uh, as Justin already mentioned, and yes, Mr. Vice President, we will keep up to your promise and we will uh, reach out to you for another discussion if possible. But well, just as a final remark, I could say, and we witnessed that by the response and participation and interest to this event, it confirms really the significance of this topic and the necessity for discussions, whether in this format or, uh, or even uh, further. And from our behalf of RGSL, I think we will keep an eye on that and continue organizing discussions like this. Thank you very much for all the participants and we look forward to see you in other our events. Thank you, have a nice day.